about myself. Again, my name is David Kelly. I'm a long-term <coughs> purchase co-op here in Great Barrington. Um, I wear many hats the co-op right now. I am promotion liaison, pricing coordinator, and lead buyer. So it does a lot to do. <laughs> um, so one of the cool things about working at the co-op is my exposure to some of the really, you know, it's unfortunate to hear this gentleman here, but there are some really great people out there doing some really good work, and part of my job is to, you know, try to source the best and try to find the, you know, um, best quality uh, people to buy from. This, you know, buying is extremely important. The choices we make as a business and who we support. Um, so one of the really great people that I work with is a group called People Exchange. They're out of Boston. Um, they're a leader in their field, and uh, um, they do these origin trips, they call them, and I had the great opportunity to go to the Peruvian Amazon and stay and live with these people for two weeks, stay with the farmers in their homes, get to know their families, work the farms with them every day, um, and it was a really great experience, and it's unfortunate to hear, hear this gentleman point of view, um, there's always bad actors out there who will take advantage of others. Um, we can't let that you know, take away from the good work that people do here too. So I'm just gonna take a minute and show just a couple of photos from my experience. Um, I visited the Oro Verde Cooperative in Lamas, Peru. And this is a group photo, all the people from the cooperative. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, group photo, everybody from the cooperative. Um, I was one of six people from across the country that ch chosen to go on this trip and have this experience. So it's very special to me. Um, so this is one of the cacao farms that we went to visit. Um, these hikes, it was a two hour hike in 100 degree heat. These people do this every day. And so you can see it's very muddy. Um, rough terrain. Um, so, you know, the journey is two hours. It's hot. Um, another thing is everything that you need, you have to bring on your back. And so, one of the cool things about them joining the cooperative that I visited and being part of the exchange is they've earned enough money now to buy a motorized bike with a car attached to the back so they can carry their family um, through this rugged terrain. Even though they can only drive to a certain point and walk the rest of the way, um, it's an improvement in their lives. Um, this is Leslie. He was uh, one of the leaders of the Oral Verde Cooperative, and he's uh, uh, the gentleman that I stayed with in this family. This is his uh, farm. Just a beautiful photo, um, more of the hike up to uh, the cacao farm here. Um, again, it's rugged terrain, but the most beautiful place that you probably could ever want to visit. Um, it's considered a high jungle, so there's lots of mountains, lots of rough terrain. Actually, this was actually on the way to one of the coffee farms that we visited too. Um, they hike these mountains every day, all the way up this terrain, all on top of all these mountains for coffee fields, five or six thousand feet up. Um, this is a trek that has to be done 100% on foot, very small pathways. Again, whatever they bring in, they have to bring out on their backs, including their product. Uh, this is little baby cacao. So it starts out as a little flower, and then you start to get these tiny little pods, and then they grow into these big, large uh, pods. A cacao tree. Um, another photo of their farm. Um, 
since they've joined their cooperative, they have actually earned enough money to move off of their farm and get a small place in town. Um, so they have running water now, they have access to internet and electricity, uh, which they didn't have before. They lived here uh, full time. And so now they're you know, enjoying the benefits of sending their kids to school and educating themselves at the same time. And it gives them greater access to the co-op. So here, this is Leslie, this is the gentleman we stayed with again. So a lot of their day, because um, a lot of times when they hike there, they're staying there for a couple of days. And again, you have to bring everything with you. Um, a lot of what they do when they get there is there's sugar cane everywhere. They'll juice the sugar cane so that they all have something to drink. But all this is very, very time consuming. And the less time that they're spending harvesting their cacao, um, there's less money that they make. Um, so they spend a lot of time um, just doing the essentials of life, too. Just a beautiful view from your farm. So another thing that this gentleman has been able to do, this is just a very simple juicer. So he's been, he's been able to make enough money to buy this juicer. He was very proud of this juicer. It's like made $600 here in the US, a huge amount of money for him and his family. But it's that right there, believe it or not, has changed their life. They can spend 10% of the time that they used to spend to uh, you know, juice their their sugar cane by hand, which is you know, you can imagine really just grueling and a time-consuming thing to have to do every day. So now he just goes and cuts his cuts it, sends it to the juicer, and it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. And they can spend most of their time harvesting their cacao and working on their their uh, plantation. Mm -hmm. Cow pod, red right, cow pod. Mm -hmm. um, they grow, I think he said, eight or ten different varieties of cacao there. Um, and you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, chocolate is a huge business. And the best chocolate, the best cacao is from little tiny little farms um, by people who really care, who care about their land, who care about their products, and they care about their families and they're thinking generations out. So, you know, everything they do is for the future and for their families, and uh, it's just great. More cacao. Leslie, chop me up some cacao. That's what the cacao looks like after it comes out of the pod. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's like this uh, slimy membrane over top of the bean. But the 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 bubble bean is right under me. <laughs> that's what it looks like inside the bottom there. Very cool looking. Uh, just another view from his farm. Oh, I thought this was really cool. <laughs> I just wanted to share a cashew. We were just walking through the jungle and all of a sudden here's a cashew tree. And I had never seen it like that before. And uh, it just gave me a really cool perspective. You know, these trees are not very big. They don't produce a lot of fruit. You know, I love nuts and cashews and all these things. And, you know, you, you, see, you, know, you think about it, you sit there, and you, you know, you're a couple of handfuls. That could be a whole entire tree, you know. So um, again, you know, they do a lot of uh, trading of their fruit and nuts as well. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to fill our bellies with, you know good quality cashew. That's uh, his wife, Jermaine, and his son, Luis. <laughs> Me and Luis, uh, we had brought some um, t-shirts and hats and stuff from the co-op and we gave them and they were just so super excited. Uh, okay, this is really cool too. This is um, at the Oro Verde facility. Uh, so all these up here, this is all organic certification, which I don't know if many of you know, but it's very expensive and very hard to get and very time consuming. It takes years. So these people are really very proud of what they've accomplished here in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or so. And uh, yeah, they're just really proud. 
fermenting boxes. Fermenting takes, uh, I think he said about 12 to 13 days. And these are the boxes that they ferment in. And each day, they get transferred from one box to the next, to the next, to the next. And uh, you can feel the heat coming off them. They're very hot. After they've been fermented, this is where they dry. Just thousands, there's these trays of thousands and thousands and thousands of beans. <coughs> This was really cool too. So we're in the facility. Basically, this says we don't discriminate. Doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, big, straight, handicapped, indigenous. Doesn't matter. And I was kind of blown away by that. You know, we're in, this, in the middle of a developing country where you know it's probably not taught very well. Um, I just thought that was really awesome. I wanted to share that too. And with their cooperatives. Again, coffee farms on top of all of these mountains here. We're climbing the side of these mountains, and they do this every single day. Coffee beans on the vine. Um, I also wanted to point out that uh, their coffee is what they call bird friendly. A lot of the bigger uh, producers of coffee, they clear cut land mm -hmm. by the mile. And, uh, like I said before, one of their things is they want the future, they want the land for their future, they want the land for their grandkids, and uh, they do no clear cutting, it's very bird friendly, they always try to find natural light, places where that, you know, um, are just naturally <laughs> sort of clear when we'll get uh, some good sunlight. More coffee, you know, it's inside the cherry, they call that the cherry. And that's the bean on the inside. Um, so they do all of this stuff by hand. This, there's a little machine they use to remove the cherry from the bean. And they have one person that will stand there for 12 hours a day. And just this tiny little machine to sit there and crank it and crank it, throw more in and crank it and crank it. And uh, until the work's done. And they also use the cherry for other things too. They make jellies out of it and different things. They use everything, by the way. They use everything. Nothing is wasted. Uh, yeah, this, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with what this is, but this is coca. It's the main ingredient in cocaine. Uh, many people in the region for many, many, many years were forced to grow cocaine, or forced to grow coca by cartels, by the governments, by just, you know, um, corrupt people in the area, forced by um, by violence, and these people they don't like drugs. They don't want drugs, but they had no choice. Either that, or their family starves, or like I said, they're threatened with violence. And since joining the cooperative, most of these people they don't have the road. They don't want to do this. Um, but now they can make money, they can make honest money, they can make good money. So I thought that was important to point out. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so um, I wanted to give you a little bit of happy, happy ending to the video that we saw. Um, 